All right, Avi, are you ready to go? I'm ready, yeah. Okay, great. So let, let's get started on the next talk then. So our second speaker is Avi Vigerson. Um, Avi's also a very distinguished uh, contributor to theory of computer science, has worked in many, many areas. Uh, they, and uh, he's speaking today on are we aging well and a bit on lower bounds? Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Sam, and thanks for the invitation. And it's great to be here and uh, with Dick, uh, who, as I'm sure all of you knew, was my postdoc advisor and uh, had a, an amazing influence on me and my research. Um, yeah, so I was going to talk much more about lower bounds, uh, but um, uh, so I'll explain why the title. Um, Okay, I just need to fix my view here. Okay, <clears throat> so this is uh, you know the scope of the uh, this particular workshop on the 50 years since satisfiability. <clears throat> I just uh, to put it in a bit of context because I'll talk about history. Um, um, I think that uh, well, of course, we know that with Turing's paper algorithm started and uh, was the birth of uh, computer science and of the theory of computing. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll distinguish them. And uh, the breakthrough of, 19, of the 70s, um, yeah, so that uh, lots of great theories started then and uh, set up the stage for, for us, for complexity theory. And this happened mainly in that decade that Dick talks about quite a bit uh, in detail in the mid 60s and mid 70s, well, uh, I would say that uh, I would call it the birth of the theory of computation methodology, what we exercise or call computational complexity, where we had focus on efficiency, on resources like time and space, where reductions and completeness were in introduced, classification of problems, the PNP question as we understand it was born, randomness came up at the same time, and crypto had its, uh, you know, theoretical, theoretical crypto had its inception. And then in the next 50 years, uh, I think wonderful things happen. So I can already ask, answer the question in the title, are we aging well? I mean, brilliantly well. Uh, we grew and uh, became mature and got uh, deeper and broader and very diverse, uh, introducing lots of models and settings and investigating them, discovering many interconnections between them and started collaborating with many other scientists, other sciences. So lots of great theories were born and uh, lots of new challenges. And uh, one would think, and in fact, it, it is a fact that, uh, you know, lots of confidence would come with that. And it did, but uh, somehow there were also some crises. And uh, uh, that, that uh, as I was started preparing the talk a week ago, somebody sent me a, uh, you know, maybe it was a mistake to read this very long um, exchange uh, in a chat that uh, had to do initially with some uh, Stock Fox uh, um, rejection, but got into discussion of uh, real issues uh, that people are feeling about the subject of theory. So I decided to investigate how to talk to that. So here are questions that came up in this. Uh, I'm, you know, making them general. Is theory relevance to practice? Asymptotic bounds useful at all? Do models need real world motivation? Should we focus on problems, on techniques? Is people simply any good as a problem goal for the field? Which problems are important given the diversity? You know, how can we tell, uh, you know, given so many different areas? Are we mathematicians or computer scientists? Identity crisis. Lots of the issues that came up and the points were made were very specific about, you know, is this algorithm good or is this model motivated and so on. And this sort of reminded me uh, this uh, a very ancient uh, Buddhist fable uh, that many of you probably know about the blind people who are trying to uh, understand this huge beast and just by feeling some part of it and uh, trying to guess what it is, or uh, in this case, maybe complain about uh, part of the whole. And uh, 
I think that uh, you know why, one way to answer many of these existential issues is just uh, basically talk about this elephant in the room. I mean, to me, I look at uh, it and it's just magnificent. Uh, but uh, you know, some people don't uh, necessarily feel that or don't um, maybe see the whole picture. And I think if they don't, or if uh, anybody doesn't, then it's uh, our fault, our fault as educators. I mean, I mean, talk, I mean, educate. I think that the, um, this field has been great about doing research. It's also been great about teaching uh, students, you know, the techniques, the algorithms, the, the analysis tools and so on. But I think not enough is done about the greater mission about the whole, about the achievements, the history, the impact, the challenges um, standing high up. And uh, I think, well, one has to start from the highest, you know, point of view or the most significant bit. And I would say this is it. So uh, I think we have to realize that that's uh, the ballpark we are playing at. That's what theory of computing is about. We are just the the youngest member in this family of uh, grand theories that have very, very long-term intellectually deep goals. Um, some lived uh, thousands of years, some just several centuries, and we are, uh, you know, maybe 50 or 80 years old, but that's, that's all, we are just beginning. Uh, this intellectual goal, uh, goals they've produced and studying them produced lots of uh, uh, results of all kinds. They have also produced many, many practical applications. Uh, but I must tell you, uh, I mean, in general, we should learn from these uh, older fields. Uh, I don't see anybody coming to my colleagues in the physics or any physics department uh, uh, telling them to stop investigating black holes or uh, uh, you know, particle physics just because uh, they need help with uh, uh, fixing the light bulb or maybe even uh, creating, uh, you know, some particular um, uh, yeah, low energy capacity as capacitors or, you know, practical, important practical problems that may, may uh, heat our houses better. But, uh, you know, nobody that demands that they stop their theoretical investigation. Uh, I'm going to be very brief in summarizing some of the things we've done. I can be brief both because I have no time and uh, because uh, lots of what I'll say is summarized, uh, you know, it's detailed in uh, this book, which is free, that I wrote about a year ago, or that I published about a year ago. So I'll be, I'll be quite brief in this uh, pep talk or addressing some of the issues that I mentioned. Um, First has to do with the fact that uh, we are not only the youngest child in the in this uh, set of you know grand theories, uh, we are also very connected to the others. And this goal, the understanding the laws of computation, uh, we have to understand, or we know, in fact, it's evident that uh, computation is everywhere. So when we are studying computation, it's not just time and it's not just on computers. I mean, we are studying. Of course, we are studying them, but we are studying computers in networks, neurons in the brain, atoms in matter, cells in living tissue, and you can read prices on market, friends of Facebook. <clears throat> uh, computation happens in all of them. And uh, what we have to add to this is the methodology that I talked about before that we developed in this 50 years of work and uh, is pretty unique to us. It's very different than physics and math and biology. Uh, the ideas of classification and reduction and uh, resources and computational modeling are essential. Now, modeling, one of the issues that came up were practicality of uh, uh, models. Um, there are two stories I can tell. I mean, one uh, is that uh, Yao was once asked in the early days after he introduces, introduced communication complexity whether it's realistic and it should be studied. And this is a, you know, his reaction was sort of automatic. Of course, it's so basic. We know, of course, 50 years later what it did. The other is that often 
you know, it's important to just follow your gut. And, uh, you know, if you study bacteria in Petri dish and you believe uh, that maybe you should first study quantum bacteria and the dish has to be hyperbolic, then, uh, you know, do it because... Uh, we have to, I think, uh, of course, intellectual integrity is always important in science, but that may be necessary. And maybe I'll give you an, an example if I have time. Anyway, discovering these laws is a great challenge and great responsibility. And uh, that's what we've done. And that's what we continue to do. So let me uh, talk a bit about it. Uh, but of course, studying with the, uh, you know, scientific questions, computational in science questions, is what created this amazing connections with, uh, with all the sciences that they have grown uh, beautifully. Uh, but the picture also wants to stress that we are an independent discipline. I mean, we, in order to facilitate these connections and uh, you know, do them better, we should, we are an independent major academic discipline. And this includes the connection to math to, and to computer science. Uh, we do it, you know, across these arrows, our ideas, people, many of our greatest, you know, theorists, as many of you know, I mean, in fact, Dick went and uh, to do five years of biology, uh, you know, just took time off computer science and worked with biologists and many other examples across these uh, fields are well known. Um, Another issue, again, with respect with computer science and mathematics is this identity crisis. I used to, you know, giving talks like this, uh, you know, uh, saying that it has been extremely lucky for our field to have parents with so different genes. I mean, computer science being young and patient, whereas math is old and patient, uh, you know, one, you know, grounded in practice and demands, uh, you know, modeling of real, real life things. And uh, the other demands beauty, aesthetics, abstraction, and uh, measuring things here by performance and there by rigor. I think the influence of this total set of genes on our field and its growth has been tremendous, just uh, fantastic. Now, it seems like it can create identity crisis of the type are we mathematicians or computer scientists. And I think everyone is what they choose to be or what they, what they do best. But it's good to remember that we are not kids anymore. I mean, <laughs> we go independent of our parents as well. So over these years, I think, the, as I mentioned, the field has created, I'm not going to go over this. This is, uh, um, you know, lots of amazing, uh, theories in so many different areas. And I think that uh, sometimes we just forget this or take it for granted or just talk about specific results that we want to teach um, the students as opposed to just yeah, looking back and explaining or going into some of the things that are in them. Even very old theories contain amazing intellectual uh, you know, results and understandings. and. Uh, yeah, this is maybe with only one page. Here's another page. I mean, you just take, you know, that it takes a semester or more, maybe a year to teach each of them. And uh, not only have they, you know, huge, deep intellectual content, content, but they also, you know, they are practical. And, you know, practical one has to remember how to measure this. You cannot just talk, take a result and say, is it you know, the right constant or the right exponent already? Uh, theories, first of all, I mean, everybody takes this for granted, but everybody in industry, technology and all the practical areas, uh, you know, they use the language and tools to actually discuss what they are doing. That's you know, taken for granted and lots of it was created in this series. And the other are the many examples, I probably don't have to go through them, of theories that predated uh, and enabled um, you know, technologies in billions and billions that uh, and huge changes in society. I mean, of course, crypto and quantum computing are just uh, you know, one, one example, but you know, there are so many. 
Um, I decided against my, uh, I often feel that it's wrong to justify uh, theory by giving practical applications, really practical, you know, conceptual ideas and specific algorithms which really change industries. Uh, but anyway, I didn't make a list. I mean, it's, uh, you know, probably not going to go over this either, but you just have to imagine what, uh, you know, programming languages would have been without the linear time pass parser of Knut or with what text processing would have been without a linear time string, string matching algorithm. Or of course, uh, you know, um, Dick mentioned the uh, linear programs and uh, what computer server farms, uh, the hundreds of millions that uh, are saved by the uh, code that Gopal and the common uh, device. I'm not, you know, RSA is uh, you know, one algorithm whose impact on the world was unbelievable. But even algorithms like Shaw, who cannot be implemented, which cannot be implemented, there's no machine yet created, you know, an industry and a huge developed development of understanding quantum systems just by the, you know, giving this algorithm. And, uh, you know, the Minhash uh, algorithm of border that you know, underlies probably all of them, you know, the redundancy elimination in all big data applications. And people forget sometimes that deep learning and in general, uh, you know, lots of convex programming wouldn't exist if Leibniz didn't uh, discover the chain rule and allowed us to uh, compute gradients in linear time as opposed to quadratic time, what is called now the back propagation algorithm and so on. There are so many examples. And, uh, you know, just I think people sometimes forget them. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, this is basically what we uh, celebrate and Dick talk quite a bit about this. And I think, again, people, uh, you know, of course, it had a very concrete technical meaning when we started with it, but we understand it much better. Today, it means much more. I mean, of course, that's a classical, you know, intellectual question of asking it. Is it possible that searching for something is as easy as checking? And you go up and uh, you know, it's more or less the question is whether we can know everything we want to know. So we, we can only hope to want to know something we can check, right? Uh, can creativity, the searching part, you know, be automated? Can theorem improving be automated? Can, uh, you know, modeling by scientists be uh, you know, automated? And it leads to the question, is, are there hard problems at all? I mean, maybe everything is easy not just in polynomial time, in any, in any complexity measure, in any model. I mean, it's possible that, you know, there are so many more algorithms that we know today. We can't seem to find hard problems. I'll go back to that. But these issues, you know, picking on the P versus NP question like, oh, worst case, <laughs> why worst case? Uh, you know, it's, it, I find it's funny, it's like, to understand it, to start, or, or why, uh, um, why polynomial, why not linear time? One has to realize that when you are first faced with an exponential gap, you know, you first maybe have to make it a polynomial gap, and then you'll make it a quadratic gap, and then, and, and so on. To uncover structure, you have to pick the right resolution to start, obviously. But today I, I feel P versus MP is just the call to understand the laws of computation wherever they are. That's, that's what it is. That's the meaning of the question to me. Uh, I had this uh, example that I promised. May I just mention it? Uh, I gave last week again, it's coincidental, a, a talk about this uh, recent breakthrough because I just wanted to explain the wonders of the methodology of the theory of computation. This was two mathematicians that I'm sure all of you heard about, MIP star equal to RE, which, you know, got a lot of attention because of its impact on, on uh, physics and mathematics. It resolved all sorts of uh, problems and conjectures they were talking, you know. And this is a result uh, clearly in uh, computational complexity. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think Somehow, it, it's an amazing story, of course, and uh, what I talked in an hour, I will not go, uh, 
now into in a minute, but it's sort of an evolution that was forced by our methodology. I have the, here the, the timeline. I'm again, not going to go through it, but uh, a pretty meandering story of trying to understand the relative power of proofs and algorithms, which uh, we are still trying to do. And PVS MP is one of the many incarnations of this, but there are many other incarnations that were introduced because of randomness, because of quantumness uh, that we do understand. And this understanding not only you know, is important to us, but as you see, it's important to other fields. Okay, let me go back to this and uh, to the fact that we don't know how to prove it and how to prove low bounds. So now I want to switch to what I really meant to talk about. So good, I talked 20 minutes and now I can talk less than 20 minutes. Uh, I want to talk about low bounds uh, and uh, I want to talk about low bounds for algorithms. And uh, I think maybe I don't know a single example of an explicit low bound that is not derived by an algorithm. Anyway, the search for low bounds uh, for algorithms is a win-win situation because you know, uh, discovering the algorithms is not so bad. You know, there is one joke that uh, you know, we don't discover lower bounds because there are only algorithms. But sometimes you can use algorithms to prove lower bounds. So there are simple examples. I mean, many of you know, there are unconditional uh, results, first of all. I mean, Dick mentioned how, how many terms, the time hierarchy, it's uh, proved that P is different than exponential time, say, by diagonalization, by an algorithm, uh, simulation. It's an algorithm. More sophisticated by low degree approximation, Rasbor proved this famous result that uh, MC1 uh, cannot be done with AC0 circuit and parity. Let's say majority cannot be done. Much more sophisticated, but again, using algorithms, uh, using not trivial SAT algorithms derived from low degree approximation, uh, Williams proved this famous result that. Uh, NCP uh, and non-deterministic exponential time cannot be done in ACC zero, which he calls the annoying complexity class. I really love that. And of course, we also have uh, un we have conditional results where algorithms imply lower bounds. And if you want to improve our money term, maybe prove that NP is different than exponential time. It's really easy. You just have to give an algorithm for SAT, right? A polynomial time algorithm for SAT would do it. So that's a triviality, but you can get to the same conclusion for much weaker assumptions or seemingly weaker assumptions. Let's say you can get it from non-uniform algorithm. That's so implying a uniform conclusion. Maybe we can do that. Or uh, my favorite and what I want to talk about is this absolutely amazing uh, paper of uh, Cabanat and Impagliato on uh, with the following statement. So the polynomial identity testing problem that I'll uh, mention next, but I'm sure many of you know, if it has a deterministic polynomial time algorithm, then basically you separate the arithmetic analogs of P and NP. So of course, for people who haven't seen it, it's sort of amazing. It's a concrete problem. You give it an algorithm and you have proved the lower bound and uh, not just the lower bound, uh, you know, uh, yeah, one of our priciest goals. So if you don't know it, it's not so complicated. It's beautiful, but let's explore it. Let's prove this algorithm or at least try to. So what is the, what's the PIT problem? Um, think of a you know, field and variables in it and the ring of polynomials. And uh, we are looking at the following type of polynomial. Uh, determinant. So determinant of what? The input, uh, you should think of it as a tuple of matrices, n matrices, each of them n by n. And you think of them as defining a symbolic matrix, the sum ai xi. So it's really an n by n matrix uh, in which every entry is a linear form in these variables. And then you take the determinant and ask whether it's identically zero. This is a, then you say yes, otherwise you, you say no. That's the class PIT and Okay, so this is, a, this is a problem. If you have a deterministic polynomial time algorithm for this, then you've separated VP and VNP. 
sort of stunning. Uh, Edmond, you know, in a brilliant, you know, vision, uh, asked this question uh, 50 years ago, and um, we still don't know the answer. I mean, we had it with we have a fantastic law bar, right? Uh, it's very easy to see at the you know, this high time of uh, publicistic algorithms. Some of us noted that uh, it has a simple publicistic algorithm. You basically pl plug random small integers to the variables and compute the numeric determinant, right? Symbolic determinant has exponentially many terms, but the numeric determinant, you just do Gaussian elimination. So uh, it has a very fast randomized polynomial time algorithm, which really means, and that's uh, very dear to me, that this uh, question of low bounds is also a question of de-randomization. I mean, I, I would say low bounds and de-randomization are the topics I spent most of my uh, career on or thinking time on. So it's a de-randomization question. Uh, we can't solve it. So as we do in math and science and uh, theory, we just uh, you know try somewhat easier problems and see whether we can develop techniques for them. So one thing we looked at very inadvertently uh, got into it, and I will not tell you how, uh, is the following problem. Uh, it looks exactly the same. I give you a tuple of n matrices n by n, but I ask you that you compute the determinant of this matrix. So now it's uh, some AI tensor Xi. Also the Xi is a matrix of variables, which is n by n. So it's a very similar problem, right? I mean, it's uh, when you open this tensor thing up, it's basically you're computing the determinant of n squared by n squared matrix of linear forms. Looks exactly the same. I put star there because it's like the star I put in MIP star. It's sort of a quantum version of the original or non-commutative version of the original. And uh, yeah, maybe you should wonder a second which problem you think is harder. Although because of time, let me answer you. Uh, it's also obvious. Uh, yeah, so it's an easier problem. This uh, quantum version is an easier problem. There's this sort of a simple direct reduction, which is more or less what I said a minute ago. So it's an easier problem. So maybe we can solve this one. And indeed we can. I mean, that's uh, what we did about five years ago and actually got me to spend most of my time on this type of um, um, questions and techniques in the past five years. So the first message is this problem, which is a sub-problem of the problem we really want to solve, has a deterministic polynomial time algorithm. The second thing, which is even more amazing, is the way what this algorithm looks like. I mean, it's an algebraic problem, right? But actually, the and I'll say more about it, it's sort of a gradient descent. So now it seems like maybe we can access by Cabanet in Pagliazzo again, can access uh, this big problem, permanent versus determinant or VP versus VNP, via optimization tool. And I still think we can. So let me talk about uh, this uh, for the last five or 10 minutes ahead. Yeah, so I thought that uh, before this, uh, telling you, I'll tell you about uh, some of the applications that uh, this result has. I mean, it's a result in some computational or algebraic complexity theory type of thing. I mean, it's sort of stunning to me, even though I know, <laughs> uh, I know how and why things happen, that uh, it's connected uh, to so many things. I mean, as part of proving this, uh, we, we realized that uh, it uh, solves problems in non-commutative algebra and in analysis. And actually it's sort of even stunning that it at the same time can deal with proving identities and with proving inequalities. In the case of non-commutative algebra, the type of identities that you want to uh, prove or compute, uh, verify is, uh, you know, things like normal formulas only in non-commutative variables. It turns out, yeah, okay, I'll say it. This is hard because unlike the commutative case, this uh, nested inversions cannot be eliminated. Uh, in, in, a, in fact, it was not known for a long time whether this problem is decidable. This is called the world problem for non-commutative fields. In the inequality side, 
there's a large family that I will not explain of inequalities, but you know them. I mean, whether a product of, uh, whether the integral of a product is most a product of, basically of integrals and uh, whether there are, there are you know, inequalities like this, uh, special cases of which abound. I mean, Koshi Schwarz, Holder, Bun Minkowski, Lumis Whitney and Nelson hypercontractivity and many others that you know are just special cases of this. So when I give you such an inequality, you want to check whether it holds or not, or what's the optimal constant. That's the uh, Braskamp-Lieb inequalities. And as it turns out, um, we, we understood really part of uh, the, the process of understanding this um, PIT, PIT star question was understanding these problems. And it turned out that uh, they have this relationship. The world problem is like, equivalent to it. And the uh, bus complete is even easier. It sits inside. And so they automatically get polynomial time algorithm. And after our work, uh, people discovered more connections of this very basic, you know, simple to state PIT star beyond what, you know, to other areas you wouldn't imagine are related. There are really beautiful results in statistics resolving long-term questions on maximum likelihood estimation in matrix and uh, tensor normal models. And uh, to uh, M estimation, this is about elliptical distribution. And an operator theory, uh, you know, just recently resolved the Paulson problem that was open for 25 or 30 years in this field, just using um, many of these techniques, both structural results and algorithms follow. And there are many more I, I'm not going to mention. It just, when we talk about interconnections in the field, it's not just in the field. Algorithms expose interconnections between other fields, let's say in math and uh, statistics and the uh, quantum information theory and more. Uh, but let me just uh, end with uh, talking a little bit about uh, what we know about this uh, optimization problem that comes up. So here are the two problems. Uh, I want to talk about symmetries in algebraic variety. So look at these two problems. In both of them, you know, just what you are given is a, is a set of matrices so about n cube numbers. Let's say we are over the complex numbers because that's where it makes more sense. Um, you want the determinant to vanish, so it's it's a bunch of conditions on the coefficients, which are the, just polynomial conditions on these uh, input variables. The yeah. So they are just algebraic varieties, right? Algebraic varieties are just simply solutions to systems of polynomial equations. So what, for what varieties can we easily test membership in? So that's, that's a basic question. I somehow implicitly give you such an, a variety and I give you a point in space and I ask whether it's uh, in the variety. And the understanding we have is that if this variety is a null cone, okay, what's a null cone? It's basically something captured by the symmetries. There's a group of symmetries acting on this variety. If it's captured by some um, symmetries of a nice little linear group, then uh, it supports an algorithm, an algorithm of this dynamical type, the, the gradient descent, in fact, algorithm, only in some uh, different space that what we are used to, not, uh, you know, not Euclidean space, but some other curved space, geodesic, uh, basically the manifold that describes the group. So th the real reason this algorithm I told you before works is that this PIT star, this quantum version of PIT, special case of PIT is an outcome of a very simple group action. And we were trying for a couple of years to, uh, you know, just do it for extend it to uh, PIT. And uh, we failed and didn't know for a while why, but uh, eventually Visu Makam and I found uh, a barrier is that it's not an outcome. So you can, you know, discover properties about varieties, uh, but it's just a barrier, you know, maybe one can extend these techniques. Um, just to summarize this sort of point of view, I mean, this, problem of memberships in null cones, every problem I've shown you in the previous two slides are problems of this type, and there are many others I didn't show you. There are, just ask about memberships in, in null cones. So we have algorithms for that. 
And this, uh, this uh, last paper in the, in the series just develops geodesic convex optimization of this, uh, of this type of um, you know, problems. And uh, we get new algorithms and we still hope that maybe they will give us uh, lower bounds. But uh, an important message, some important messages. One is that you need some math to actually analyze these algorithms, even though they are simple to describe. And the symmetry, which is uh, you know just perfect matching, is also a, a, an outcome problem. When when you learn or uh, think about the perfect matching problem, you don't, at least not obviously, think about symmetries and group action and so on. But thinking about this this way gives you new algorithms for uh, problems, including perfect matching. Um, and uh, for those in the know, uh, it's naturally connected, even though it started very differently, it's connected to the GCT geometric co uh, complexity theory uh, of uh, Malmali and Sohoni, where they also try to separate VP and VNP using uh, invariant representation theory. Basically, by thinking about them, these classes, as algebraic varieties. So there are lots of connections that I will not discuss. Uh, and uh, lastly, let me mention that just null cons are just the beginning of the type of questions uh, that this setting of symmetries suggests. I mean, it's all part of uh, invariant theory and algorithms in invariant theory is, uh, you know, well-developed subjects, only that many of the algorithms use things like Gobner basis and uh, techniques like that that require exponential or doubly exponential time. So it's... Uh, it, uh, gives new algorithms for many of these that are much faster, but also, uh, you know, suggest that uh, we extend them to other problems like orbit problems. Orbit problems generalize null problem. It's just, uh, you know, here are examples. But anyway, <laughs> my point is, it's a lot of fun <laughs> discovering algorithms while you are trying to pull low ones. Um, here are examples of uh, you know, orbit problems. Of course, graph isomorphism is an orbit problem for the symmetric group acting on the vertices of a graph that we know. Um, in this recent paper, we, we explore questions of this type. Um, you know, will Mars and Earth ever collide? So dynamical systems look at the orbits of two objects given initial conditions. Or similarly with the cue ball, pocket the red ball eventually, if you know how it starts. And for this audience, I thought I'd end just with uh, <laughs> uh, one consequence of this algorithm that we developed in this uh, paper, because of course we didn't um, invent it, it just came out uh, as a special case of this type of uh, uh, problem about orbit. So uh, maybe it's an easy problem, I don't know. I've never seen it and I didn't think that it doesn't look so easy to solve otherwise, but uh, let me tell you what the problem is. By the way, here the algorithms are algebraic, not analytic. Okay, so what's the problem? Uh, uh, you have a graph, a bipartite graph, maybe it's a complete bipartite graph, doesn't matter. And I give you two sets of integer weights for the edges, maybe the, the blue weights and the red weights, okay? And now you look at all perfect matchings of this graph. And what I asked you, is it the case that every perfect matching in this graph has the same total weight on the red weights and on the blue weights. So is it the case that all of them, each perfect matching has the same weight or it is not the case? Turns out that this is a, has a polynomial time algorithm. Maybe it can be done in a yeah, simple way, but I don't know. Okay, uh, enough, so let me... Uh, uh, summarize, my time is basically up. Let me go back to the uh, thing I started with. Uh, as I said, we've grown big and diverse and there are some growing pains that uh, um, you know have to be discussed. I think that our enormous successes uh, have brought uh, you know lots of growth, diversification, influx of amazing young talent. I think it's just wonderful to watch. Uh, people coming into our field. Uh, we want lots of scientific respect, lots of industrial respect, lots of societal respect. 
I think we are not doing that great, or some are not doing that great on self-respect, but I hope this will improve also. So I think we should uh, read everybody. I mean, uh, and uh, thinking about the field, uh, what, you know, how it should run itself. I think it should uh, stay independent of all other fields, including computer science and including mathematics. It uh, should stay cohesive because of the amazing interconnections between its sub areas and subfields that so well feed each other. Um, I think that uh, because we are growing, I mean, we are a young field and have to learn maybe from older fields, uh, older disciplines, uh, but not learn everything. Uh, maybe have to reorganize the way we are working, the way our conferences are run, lots of things about uh, um, the way the field is, is organized. So there are lots of things to think about, to make it, uh, to keep it healthy and dynamic and wonderful as it has been so far. I think it's extremely important to just, you know, uh, look at what was done especially in areas you don't know so well, and internalize not just the technical value, but the meaning and the conceptual value of this work, and then use it uh, in education. I'd say that that's the main message of my, my talk. It's very important in, in uh, courses to describe history, to describe flow of ideas, to describe motivation, to describe impact besides uh, you know, besides giving the proofs that, uh, you know, the algorithm runs in analog and time. So anyway, uh, of course, this is a celebration. So let me end in a happy note. Uh, happy anniversary, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Great talk. Um, also very inspiring. Uh, we have a chance for some questions. So we have about 15 minutes or as long as you want to take really for questions. Um, Shall I also... stop, the, stop the sharing maybe? Yes, you can stop the sharing. Yeah. Well, I'm going to switch back to. Um, so we'll have some questions here. If people like, we can go to Gather Town afterwards. Someone would have to post a link in the window because I don't have it readily available for the, the group. Um, but at any rate, uh, please either unmute yourself and ask questions or um, Type them into the chat window and I'll read them for you. And in the meantime, An Antonina just posted a Gather Town link um, to, I guess, all panelists and attendees. I don't know if that is accessible except to Simon's in Institute members, though. So, also, well, maybe you can read, uh, but uh, yeah, also, if anybody wants to ask verbally, just go ahead. But yeah. uh, Sam, you can, I cannot, uh, let me not go into the chat. You can tell me if somebody. Okay, uh -huh. and the other comment was, if anyone wants to be um, promoted from attendee to panelist, either O meet or I, if, if O meet is still here, can, can do that for you. Um, so while we're waiting for people to come in with questions, um, let me start off with, we don't have any in the chat window yet, so please, please post some, but let me just start off with something very early in your talk, you asked, are there hard problems at all, I think was your exact quote. And uh, yeah. of course, there's things like the halting problem. I was wondering if you could clarify more what you what you mean by that. And so what on. I mean uh, by that is things that <laughs> things that we think, uh, yeah. So so of course we know low bounds are also uh, monotone low bounds, and uh, um, yeah. So when I said any, I mean any of the ones we don't know. But uh, to make it more concrete on, let's say, on general models of computation. We don't have a single uh, super linear low bound for any problem, for any problem in NP. Just or in exponential time, we don't have super linear low bounds, right? In E, we don't have a, So it's it's just striking. I mean, it's just what's going on. I mean, I, uh, you know, I can say personally, let's say, you know, maybe 40 years I've been thinking about uh, ways of trying to do it. And there are people uh, you know, in the audience that have you know, similarly devoted uh, decades to thinking about this, trying uh, all sorts of approaches. And uh, I think the fact that we don't know this, I mean, uh, again, says something fundamental. Of course, we know in mathematics, uh, and that's, I think, the frame of mind that we should uh, think of, uh, we should have. There are problems that uh, took decades to solve. 
So I think one uh, certain explanation is that we are far from having developed the techniques to deal with the, uh, this kind of problems. Uh, it's just, uh, we don't, uh, you know, that, that, well, I could say many, many uh, problems about space complexity, about communication complexity. Um, but yeah, you can stick with time and size. That's when, uh, maybe the easiest. We seem to be uh, totally lacking, uh, you know, like we don't know that P is different than L, right? We don't know that, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. We can separate logarithmic space for polynomial time and, uh, or, or uh, uh, NP from P space or P from P space. I mean, it just, uh, I would say we don't know anything, <laughs> although we know a lot. So uh, uh, I think the question of whether there are hard questions, uh, hard problems at all is, is a valid one. I mean, it's, uh, we have a pathetic state of understanding of law one. Yeah, yeah, just to, to, to to echo what you say, I'm in a math in, in, in a math department, and my colleagues occasionally ask me what's going on in the field, and I'll tell them our state of ignorance is completely profound. Right? We don't have superlinear lower bounds for concrete problems. We don't have superlinear lower bounds for circuit size and proof, proof complexity. The only lower bounds for systems like Frego is quad quad quadratic because you have to mention all the subformulas in the formula you're proving, and right. it's just we are. Utterly right. ignorant in many ways, but as you said, of course, they made huge progress as well. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah, it says something. It's really fundamental. These are hard problems. They are uh, not uh, not you know. I don't see any difference from the Riemann hypothesis. They are fundamental problems. If they are prime, uh, you know, uh, object is a prime numbers. Uh, our prime objects are you know circuit size <laughs> proof, uh, and proof size. Have your attention, please. There has been a fire line. Oops, okay, sorry, we have a... Oh, there I didn't hear. There. Okay, all right, um, let me see. So let's open, hopefully some people will ask some questions here. Let's open the floor to other questions. Uh, oh, Ido has raised his hand. Ido, you wanna talk? Ido, two people raised their hand. Let me see how this works. If you've raised your hand, let's start with Ito. Are you able to speak? Are you a panelist or should I upgrade you? Oh, I see there's an attendee with a raised hand here. Um, let, me, let me figure out how to do this. I think Maria also raised Hello. her hand. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, oh, hi. Yes, so um, thanks for this uh, talk. Uh, my, my question is, uh, is this, uh, you, you have, uh, described um, uh, your your wish to separate uh, uh, the theory of computing as a, as, as a discipline from mathematics of course it is uh, it is quite different than, than application but uh, how would you say uh, you characterize the difference between the theory of computing and mathematics as two different fields what is what is the difference the inherent difference between them and how would you explain it to other people there is no different, no, I don't, <laughs> I, I have, I, I am extremely comfortable with this split personality or identity crisis. I think of myself as a computer science and mathematician with no problem, but what like the differences between topology and geometry and analysis and algebra, uh, each of them has a, a type of objects that they are studying and type of goals that are very different from each other. Our charge is understanding computation. And as a, there is no problem whatsoever to think of this, of the theory of computing as a subfield of mathematics. Oh, but again, I but again, I just want to say, but again, uh, unlike many fields of mathematics, we are connected, inspired and uh, motivated by computational models that are arising from uh, computer science applications or biology applications or physics applications. I think that we are an independent field. It's not like to reject anything else. We are connected to all these other fields and certainly mathematics inspires our way of work. We prove theorems, but uh, I think what I think it's really important that we separate ourselves in the way we operate, in the 
connection between us, between the uh, different sub-disciplines of the theory of computation. I think it's very important that we recognize that uh, studying algorithms and complexity is a large enough field as it is. Of course, you can, it's fine if you want to think of it as also a sub-branch of mathematics or also as a sub-branch of computer science. <coughs> And soon, maybe a sub-branch of biology, <laughs> but it's not. We are separate. Um, okay, yes. Okay, thank you. See, we had another hand raised. Uh, could you speak up if possible? Who was it? I missed. Otherwise, um, well, I, there's a, a question in the chat window, uh, let me see, I'll just read it, I guess. Thomas Kochman asks, uh, to the question whether theory is in the center of all, is it maybe the underlying idea that any abstract mathematical understanding is based on computational algorithms in our brains? Okay. So I, I, yeah, yeah, it's a good, yeah. So first of all, uh, in another talk that I gave, I, I mentioned that uh, Anybody with uh, even my limited uh, knowledge of PowerPoint can put anything in the center of the universe. And I chose to put us in the center of the universe. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that, uh, but, but I completely agree. I think that the algorithm or computation are you know, is essential parts of uh, things that go on in nature, things that go on in our brain, uh, practically <laughs> anything that is not totally stagnant and doesn't move uh, has an algorithmic component in it. I think that uh, the message that uh, physicists and biologists should integrate uh, algorithmic thinking, resource counting, you know, precise resource counting, um, uh, just testing the feasibility of scientific theory has to be partly its predictability and predictability, you know, is something that you can compute. This is a computation. So not just your description of nature is, is computational, but your model should be computational. And if what your model, if the predictions of your model are too complex to compute, they take exponential time, something is wrong with the model. I don't believe that nature is like that. And also what's the value of uh, having a model where you cannot and when I say exponential time, it can be a completely different measure. When you are studying the brain, you have to make sure that this, uh, you know, I guess the heat dissipated inside your skull and the, you know, the memory that uh, no one can hold. All this should play into account. You, you cannot just say, you know, oh, we the way we remember uh, to to say the digits backwards is because of blood. You have to support it by some algorithmic model and resources and yeah, like Valiant has done in the circuits of the mind. It's not to mean that this model is correct. This is a style of model that should be adopted that accounts for the algorithmic parts, the resources and so on. All right. So um, thank you for, for a great talk, Avi. And uh, I do agree with, with the way you uh, put it uh, just now, which is that computation can be like a constraint on how physicists model phenomena, for example, or how scientists model phenomena. But I had another question with regard to, you focus mostly on lower bounds and, and I was thinking about parameterized complexity. So we, we are able to solve um, classes of instances, for example, in the case of say SAT, um, quite quickly, um, and we still don't have a proper characterization of these classes of instances. Uh, on the other hand, there have been there's been a lot of work in parameterized complexity, uh, which is where they've proven um, good upper bounds under parameterization. So, I was wondering whether you had any comment about that. Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, I can uh, speak about it for an hour. <laughs> yeah. I think it, uh, it was a great insight, like many insights, that there is, uh, you know, often another parameter that governs uh, uh, complexity uh, besides input size, and uh, it's been used in, uh, in lots of works. Parameterized complexity is one 
excellent example. It's not the only example. So uh, Dick talks quite a bit about, I think somebody asked him about the question of uh, um, uh, structure of problems or structure of inputs to problems that make it easy uh, in some cases, even though we believe they are hard in general. So I think pursuing these avenues is, uh, is of course, bread and butter, and uh, we have been doing it, and there's a lot more that should be done. He mentioned the book by Tim Rothgarden that uh, has surveys on various aspects of this, that uh, works that have done, and uh, of course, uh, everybody knows about uh, deep learning. I mean, here's a class of algorithms that is doing wonders uh, on problems that should be difficult, like uh, some non-convex optimization problems. And obviously, they are solving, again, the easy instances. But what are the easy instances? So we are, uh, you agree, I focused on low bounds and uh, maybe computational complexity. The algorithmic side, which is a flip side, which is, uh, you know, as I said, they are very well connected, uh, is extremely important in understanding for which problems, important problems, which parameters or what uh, characterizes easy um, is instances, maybe more generally having an instance-based complexity theory that will ex explain not just, not worst case, not average case, but the complexity of every instance in some sense, whatever it is. I'm sure lots of you can do it. So yeah, these are great questions. We have, and we have so many. Okay, uh, there's another question in the chat window. Uh, Maria Paola Bonacina asks, uh, my question is dual to Ito's. Why isn't the theory of computation a subset of computer science? So in a sense, it has already been answered. However, I think the theory of computation is a subset of computer science and I remain of this opinion. Thanks for the talk. So. Yeah, no, so I think, yeah, yeah I'm so we are We are a part of a lot and we, uh, uh, talk to a lot, but I think just that the study of the, the intrinsic study of computation is a field, right? It, it, has, it has so much in common and learn so much from so many other fields, but it's a field of its own. It's not in the service of anything. It will serve everything. It will serve all of them, but it's not a servant to any of them. Okay. Uh, let's see, uh, Jakob. Uh, Nor Norstern has a question. Uh, Jakob, do you want to unmute and state it or I can do it for you? Uh, I'll do it, okay. Uh, he, he writes, connected to the topic of the Simon Sat semester, if we really want to understand efficient computation, including Sat solving, how do we need, oh, do, do we need to go beyond worst case, how? <laughs> Well, of course we have to go beyond worst case. And uh, <laughs> the question of how is a great uh, question. I think that it's, it's, it's the remarkable success of such solving. This is now for, I don't know, decades, uh, solving huge uh, systems like in verification and so on is, is stunning. And I think uh, understanding what is a special structure uh, that allows this is, uh, is a fundamental question because maybe it will allow solving more and other problems. Of course, there are uh, some understandings, there are lots of, you know, short implications, uh, you know, you reach, uh, you know, well, anyway, uh, I'm sure you guys know much more about this than me. But uh, yeah, I think that uh, understanding in this particular example, I mean, I don't think that is great and it's a, it's a great, uh, thing to reduce uh, uh, other problems too, but it's not the only one. There are lots of, like Dick mentioned, uh, linear programming uh, or even integer programming, where in many cases uh, you have uh, fast solutions. And again, the problems solved by deep learn learning are also, you know, uh, seemingly difficult. So uh, I, I wish I knew how to <laughs> how to build a theory that's missing. Uh, and, uh, but I think the way we are going about solving this type of problems and the fact that we are taking them on is uh, the beginning of uh, another success. All right. Well, on that note, we should probably end. Uh, thank you again so much for the fabulous talk uh, to both you and Dick, in fact. So, and thanks again. I'll pretend to clap on behalf of everybody. Okay. And uh, so uh, those of you who are Simon's 
uh, participants can go to the gather town link. I'm afraid we don't have any way to accommodate people who, who aren't participants. So, but, uh, so you can also hang out here for a few minutes if you want to talk as well. But otherwise, uh, thank you again to everybody. Okay, thank you, Sam. Thanks, everybody. All right.